Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Council for Responsible Nutrition, Vitamin D and Me podcast. We're delighted today to have another acclaimed guest, Professor Davasambu Gama, has joined us. Uh, and uh, Professor Gama, very nice to have you today. Thank you so much for spending some time with us to discuss vitamin D and uh, health. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited and happy to be here. Thank you kindly. And uh, Dr. Ganma, you've got um, quite quite a list of uh, institutions and uh, academic groups and research partnerships and collaborations you belong to. Can you tell us a bit sort of about yourself and your career and what got you going in uh, vitamin D and related nutritional research? Uh, sure. Well, I am assistant professor in the Department of uh, Medicine, Howard Medical School, Brigham and Women Hospital, and also um, I have affiliation at the Department of Nutrition House School of Public Health. Uh, we are interested, um, uh, or me and my group, um, epidemiologists, we are um, interested to study about nutrition and its connection with disease, and uh, more specifically about uh, nutrients, micronutrients such as vitamin D, uh, and uh, uh, outcomes of interest. Um, it's um, it's different areas, including infectious disease, tuberculosis, um, some hormonal cancers, and so on. Um, we have also established a Mongolian Health Initiative back in the country where I am originally um, from, um, where we have been also doing harvest-sponsored, NIH-sponsored study related to nutrition, clinical trials, and um, feeding trials, and so on. Very interesting. And is that focused on uh, vitamin D or aspects of that focused on vitamin D or is it more broad based across the uh, study population? Um, it's, uh, we've been doing uh, different um, studies there, um, population based studies, nutritional studies, um, some capacity building, uh, lab um, and so on. But uh, we have also done um, several um, around 20 um, vitamin D related studies so far with Harvard uh, faculty, students, postdocs, um, and obviously with our Mongolian colleagues. Wonderful. So are these multi-site studies with, with sites in Mongolia and the U.S., or is it more there's a, there's a study specific to the Mongolian population and a study specific to the U.S. population? Uh, it's uh, mostly specific for Mongolia population. It does also include some studies relevant or specific to the United States. Um, they, uh, we work there as an international team, including um, Harvard students, as I said, faculty, mm -hmm. uh, Mongolian students, scientists, as well as other uh, faculty who are in the United Kingdom, for instance, or in China, in Kazakhstan. So it's pretty interdisciplinary, multinational kind of team where we specifically um, study mostly nutrition-related research um, uh, as well as a capacity building back in Mongolia. Very interesting. And then in terms of the nutritional uh, piece associated with some of the diseases you're looking at, uh, can you unpack that a little bit further for us in relation to some of the disease you're looking at, some of the findings you've published, and some of the current things you're working on? Sure. Um, so I think the main reason for us uh, actually um, to do studies in Mongolia was that because Mongolia uh, located um, in high northern latitude, um, Mongolian population is one of the populations with the lowest national vitamin D levels there. So it's very interesting for us uh, to select such a population where actual interventions can bring um, more benefit, uh, so to speak, to the population. Um, I mean, it's pretty obvious at this point, I think, if you are not vitamin D deficient, if you have enough food uh, fortified with vitamin D, if you take a vitamin D supplementation you, when you are outside, um, you know, in the, during sunny uh, weather, um, and the, there are not much, I guess, benefit if you get additional vitamin D. But if you do studies um, for the outcomes of interest in the study, populations where there is a high prevalence of vitamin D deficiency, that's where exactly you can see the difference and outcome which you are looking for. 
And what are some of the the outcomes tied to deficiency, some of the relationships there between deficiency and disease that you've observed in your research? Uh, so far, myself and my team, uh, we have uh, been studying vitamin D deficiency in um, first in children, uh, primary school age children, school age children, uh, then um, in reproductive age women, pregnant women, um, and then uh, in uh, population base, uh, both in countryside, as you know, Mongolia, 40% of Mongolian population are nomads. Um, so uh, both in rural and urban area, uh, elderly population and so on. Uh, the interesting thing, I think, in Mongolia, when we have started the studies back in 2004, vitamin D deficiency was not an issue at all. <laughs> um, there was not much awareness, and believe it or not, there was um, no lab where we could measure vitamin D levels. Uh, so it was wasn't an issue because no one was looking for it. Exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So we have um, seen, uh, you know, vitamin D. So first we wanted to establish what is the vitamin D deficiency prevalence there. And uh, the prevalence in different age or gender or location, um, depending who you are, where you are, how old you are, and what your social economic status and so on. Um, and then we wanted to see uh, the functional outcomes of vitamin D. If you replete vitamin D, how much you should be given them um, or the population, uh, kids, um, you know, male, female, nomads, office workers and so on. Uh, what is the dose? Uh, how much is the duration? What is the quickest way to replete? And then uh, once um, it happens, what are the functional outcomes in terms of acute respiratory infections, in terms of TB infection, TB disease, eczema, asthma, atopic dermatitis. Um, we've been doing um, quite a range of uh, different functional yeah. outcomes there, including some uh, with um, you know, non-skeletal vitamin D effects there. Mm. And when, when these deficiencies in the various patient populations are corrected uh, with these interventions, what are, what are some of the sort of revealing outcomes that you found in your research? I think a couple of, uh, of the studies were very um, exciting. Um, uh, first of all, um, Mongolia has a uh, cold, long winter, as many of um, you know. Uh, so uh, during the winter time and spring, early springtime, the biggest burden is the acute respiratory infections, as well as the pneumonia in kids, especially in younger kids. So we were able to show that just uh, um, uh, supplementing children with vitamin D fortified milk or just regular vitamin D supplementation, um, you can reduce um, acute respiratory infection by 50%. Um, that was one of the exciting studies. Um, another smaller study was that we were giving uh, 800 IU of vitamin D to the kids in, uh, for six months, and we showed that um, it could also reduce latent TB infection, tuberculosis infection in kids again. Um, compared to the placebo group. Um, uh, another clinical trial with um, uh, MGH, uh, Dr. Carlos Camarga, we have shown that giving 1,000 IU of vitamin D to kids between 2 to 19 years of age could really reduce eczema-associated um, eczema complications. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have been also very excited with one of our studies where we, uh, when kids were given vitamin D supplementation in vivo and then tested in vitro or in cell, we could show uh, that it could um, increase uh, catelicidin level, uh, which is one of the antimicrobial peptides, which really fights with um, infectious agents, um, viruses, bacteria, and so on. Um, so there's uh, uh, some of the exciting results uh, we've been able to report. Oh, wow. And very, very excellent, intriguing. And would you um, anticipate or hypothesize that 
those results would also show up in in other populations that have deficiency. Obviously, the, the the population studied in those specific studies were in the Mongolian area of the world, but that's portable or translatable, would you say, to other populations in other jurisdictions? That's a very good question. I mean, um, that's a uh, part of our studies, uh, especially the acute respiratory infection and vitamin D study was included in one of our um, meta-analysis of systematic review. The lead author for that paper was Adrian Martini at the UK. In 2017, we published in British Medical Journal where we showed where um, the data from um, uh, clinical, randomized clinical trials where vitamin D were given uh, to uh, population um, different countries, right? Uh, mm -hmm. America. Um, the study uh, results were pooled um, and we were able to show that it was true um, in terms that, you know, vitamin D supplementation can prevent against acute respiratory infections. And especially it was true in those uh, uh, places where vitamin D deficiency prevalence highest. So it is generalizable to the population where vitamin D deficiency is pretty um, prevalent. And when you, you and your team as a group of researchers uh, look at designing these studies, uh, how are you defining uh, deficiency? So um, that's also another great question that's been, um, uh, you know, uh, people were saying. So uh, uh, we were defining vitamin D deficiency at 10 nanogram milliliter as deficient, severely deficient. Um, and then um, depending where you are, I think. So we know that the Institute of Medicine uh, here in the United States, the vitamin D levels below 20 nanogram per milliliter are considered to be deficient, right? But the Institute of um, Endocrinology, um, uh, you know, set up the deficiency level, uh, anything below 30 nanogram per milliliter, um, should be deficient or insufficient level. Mm. In the countries where vitamin D deficiency is quite prevalent, there are very few um, subset of population who have above 30 nanogram per milliliter. For instance, in our study populations back in Mongolia, uh, majority of people or kids or participants would have um, below 20 nanogram milliliter and very few about 30 nanogram per milliliter. That's really interesting. And then in terms of, uh, uh, you, you mentioned uh, endocrinology. So for the people out there who may not be familiar with that term, you've mentioned that term a couple of times. What is endocrinology as a field of study? Right. So um, the vitamin D levels um, I just mentioned, uh, the recommendation were given by endocrine society. Uh, and the client society, uh, these are people, uh, scientists who are um, uh, studying about hormones. And vitamin D is uh, much more than vitamin, right? It's a hormone. Structurally, if you look, it's uh, similar to uh, androgen, estrogen, progesterone, or cortisol. It's uh, one of the steroid hormones. And as steroid hormone, vitamin D's receptors can be located in many different um, tissues, in more than 37 tissues in human body, including brain, lung, kidney, and reproductive organs. Uh, as a hormone, vitamin D uh, connects with its specific receptor, vitamin D receptor, and then it can enter, um, it enters the nucleus, and that's how it turns on and turns off certain genes. Um, so about 200 genes in human body are responsive to vitamin D and vitamin D receptor. So that's how vitamin D... Is that relatively high? It's really amazing, um, impressive number, I think. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah, it's all relative, right? So, no, that's interesting. And then when we talk about vitamin D deficiency in terms of other nutrients, what, what have you seen... When sufficiency then occurs for vitamin D, what does that do to other nutrients or, or how does it work alongside other nutrients for individuals uh, that you've studied? 
Uh, that's also another great question, I think. So uh, vitamin D um, itself, as we know, very important for calcium metabolism, right? That's been known for so many years. Um, so uh, the, um, besides uh, calcium, uh, for the recently, especially for the recent 30 years, I think uh, there were much more focused on vitamin D functions on non-bone, non-calcium kind of related functions of vitamin D. Um, and uh, in order for vitamin D function well, there are certain uh, other nutrients uh, we should be considering. Uh, in addition to calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, protein content of the food, um, as well as uh, vitamin K or K2 especially, where um, it makes sure that vitamin D really goes where it's supposed to go rather than um, causing some uh, maybe hypertoxicity or un, uh, you know, um, unnecessary um, unneeded functions, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And then, so what? What are some of those? If someone is really ratcheting up vitamin D intakes, and obviously, uh, uh, every individual is their own custom case. But when we talk about uh, too much vitamin D or vitamin D toxicity or vitamin toxicity period, what would be um, uh, the safety profile associated with that? Uh, so, um, Institute of Medicine uh, um, has set the upper limit for vitamin D per daily intake at 4,000 IU per day. Um, and um, 4,000 IU per day, but we do know that vitamin D is pretty safe um, supplement or vitamin. Sure. Very few uh, cases of hypertoxicity um, and the main uh, um, uh, uh, main outcome of the hypertoxicity of vitamin D is at hypercalcemia, which is high levels of calcium both in blood and urine, uh, which can cause uh, different symptoms, including, um, you know, uh, uh, thirst, you want to drink a lot of time, you are uh, going and urinating very often, confusion, headache, um, vomiting, and so on. Okay. There were very few cases. I mean, people were taking very large amounts of vitamin D uh, for a long period of time without any um, obvious symptom of hypertoxicity. And we know that people who are, for instance, outside um, a lot, nomads, for instance, do, yeah, or um, life safeguards, um, people who are living in Africa, for instance, right? Uh, especially mm -hmm covered by the clothes, they make a lot of vitamin D from sun without any um, issues there. Oh, very, yeah, no, very important to note. Uh, and then when it comes to uh, uh, some of the current research you're working on in, in some of the new areas, how has uh, COVID played a role in the design of some of your current research and studies and your outlook on uh, what to look at next in your overall research program and portfolio? So we are very interested in vitamin D immunity and respiratory infection. Uh, so uh, the, I think it's quite um, exciting product, the vitamin D is. I mean, you cannot ask so many things from one, one agent. Just to, <laughs> vitamin D works both for innate immunity as well. Innate meaning the immunity which you are born with, it's non-specific. Once you come out from your mother, you already have that uh, in your body. And then um, vitamin D works for both innate ac and acquired immunity, which is trained immunity called humoral and cellular immunity. For innate immunity, for instance, uh, vitamin D works um, and helps with mechanical barrier against the bacteria or virus or fungus. In other words, our epithelium, our lung, uh, it pro uh, provides us mechanical barrier against the virus to, or bacterium to get from outside. It also helps to differentiate uh, and proliferate macrophages or dendritic cells. This is uh, all cells very important for innate immunity, which uh, they recognize virus as soon as it enters our body, engulfs it, eats it, it produces toxic chemicals to kill virus as well as affected cell itself. And without vitamin D, all these functions become really weak or not possible if you don't have enough. 
In addition to that, uh, specifically with their um, current uh, situation um, worldwide, uh, YDMD also work with um, um, acquired immunity in the way that it helps to reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines and increase or induce, make it better anti-inflammatory cytokines, which is very important during um, diseases such as COVID-19, where body really violently reacts to the viruses. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that during the later stage of disease, there is a lot of inflammation, cytokine storm, as well as a blood clotting happening. And vitamin D works in all these stages. So I think uh, it's really amazing. And as such, uh, currently we are doing the study nationwide in the United States. Okay. Uh, recruiting uh, two types of people, so to speak. Uh, people who are recently infected and in, diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2 or uh, COVID-19 within a week, as well as healthy contacts, household contacts, who are not diagnosed with COVID-19, but who are exposed. And we're trying to see whether this will protect against COVID infection, as well as protect protect against severity of disease, against hospitalization, uh, prolong the duration of hospitalization admission, as well as against mortality of this disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one thing to get it, but if one gets it, you don't want a severe case, you don't want a whole whack of symptoms, you certainly don't want hospitalization or ICU or anything of that nature. And so when it comes to... Um, Looking at epidemiological data as it relates to vitamin D and COVID, uh, what sort of general trends are you seeing in terms of deficiency versus sufficiency in what your study is trying to prove out? Right. So, um, why, uh, there have been many studies now um, uh, seeing what is the uh, relationship between the disease or new virus and vitamin D. Um, the cross-sectional studies or, or observational studies have shown pretty strong uh, connection, um, not only with SARS-CoV, but with other respiratory infections, right? Uh, either it's a virus or bacteria. Um, it's, um, it shows that though people who have a, you know, um, enough or sufficient level of vitamin D, um, it's protective. If people are deficient, they are much more prone to the disease or to the infection. Uh, for instance, here in the United States, if people are um, old, elderly people who cannot convert enough vitamin D in their skin because their skin are not already are not that um, uh, active anymore, so to speak, mm -hmm. or people who stay at home a lot, um, I think majority of us are staying home a lot. To, you know, <laughs> Uh, people are, who are not physically very active or who are, have a, you know, darker skin, like uh, black people, Hispanic people, or Asian, they are, all have much higher risk to um, infection and disease. For. And then once they are admitted to hospital or they are, uh, you know, infected, they have a much uh, worse outcome. Uh, as we said, hospitalization, ICU admission, ventilation, and so on. And why is that the case? Why is the vitamin uh, D deficiency more prevalent in those populations? Well, we really are not sure. This cross-sectional studies, this uh, association doesn't mean causation. So we really cannot mm -hmm. it out that whether it's because they have a vitamin D deficiency, they're prone to disease, or maybe they are have this disease or infections, and that's why vitamin D deficiency is there. So in order to tease it out, we really need to go in turn to the um, golden standards, randomized clinical trials. And uh, the, our trial, um, this uh, national study I just mentioned, uh, we call it a VIVID trial. Please do go to the website and check the VIVID trial, uh, which stands for vitamin in COVID-19, U.S. nationwide study, which we are really trying to see uh, without any confounding or third factor uh, to see whether mm -hmm. vitamin will protect against this disease. And is this a decentralized study or is this one you're running through clinics? It's actually, you, this is the, uh, we will, everything goes online, ascent, consent, recruitment, we're shipping supplies, vitamin D 
um, uh, blood uh, in, um, levels and supplies, everything via email. So if you just go uh, to a Vivid trial uh, website, uh, you um, can check whether you are eligible, whether you can be uh, recruited there. Um, and you, it's mostly going through the uh, labs like Quest Lab, social media, and all other platforms, basically. For the for the testing and and phlebotomy component. Exactly. Yeah. Understand. Okay, and it's nationwide, so it's it's if you're eligible for the study, geography doesn't it, is irrelevant. It, it it's not relevant as long yeah. as more than um, eighteen years of age. Um, right. And how big is the study? How many are you looking to recruit and randomize into the uh, study we're itself? Looking to recruit about three thousand people. Um, oh wow. About 1,500 or so, or 2,000, those who are uh, recently infected with COVID-19 or diagnosed, and the rest, uh, about 1,000, 1,500 from household contacts, who are healthy people who live or work closely to the people who were just diagnosed with COVID-19. And I define just diagnosed or recently diagnosed. Is there a, one how week. many? Uh, one week. Okay. Interesting. And so um, what what are you hypothesizing what is your study hypothesis for this large study it's a very interesting study and obviously super current but what are, what are you hoping to do or what are you hypothesizing uh for the study the outcome so um we um so we're hoping to provide this randomization uh randomized evidence on effect of vitamin d on both early treatment as well as post exposure prophylaxis of covid19 and we, given that COVID-19 disproportionately affects this racial or ethnic minority groups who have a high prevalence of vitamin D deficiency, uh, we are also thinking that it will provide opportunity for reduce some health disparities in these uh, populations. And, and are you uh, stratifying uh, by ethnicity as well? Are you hoping to fill um, a certain number of ethnic buckets, if you will, or categories, if you will, in the study design itself? We are targeting these populations, but we are not, um, uh, we will not uh, stratify per se. Okay. So it's still open to everybody, essentially. It's definitely open for everybody, yes. If you're otherwise eligible from the uh, other criteria. Exactly. Um, uh, we're hoping that it will reduce the risk of hospitalization and mortality among patients diagnosed with COVID-19 uh, and re reduce risk of ICU admission as well as ventilatory support um, um, and uh, also reduce self-reported total disease severity. Um, that's our main aims for the study. Interesting. Very cool. And then you talked about the uh, cytokine storm and very early on in uh, during the pandemic in North America, the, the cytokine storm was something that was focused on. Hasn't been discussed so much recently lately, but obviously it still exists. So so tell us a little bit further. Uh, what What is this cytokine storm? What's going on with that? It sounds intriguing, but it's not a good thing. <laughs> Right. Uh, so cytokines, uh, they are proteins um, produced by uh, uh, by um, our uh, immune cells. Uh, so there are, um, just to simplify, um, so uh, there are certain types of cytokines, Th1, Th17, which are does the pro-inflammatory cytokines. For instance, with uh, in terms of the COVID-19, uh, interleukin-6, IL-6 was probably mentioned, majority of people already heard about this. Um, and then um, uh, patients are given anti-interleukin-6 uh, drugs, right? Uh, so in order to, um, when uh, infection happens to body during the SARS-CoV-2, during the first phase or second phase, it's mostly viral uh, kind of of uh, responses. Um, and then during the later stage, it's mostly host immune responses. And during the host immune responses, uh, human body violently responds to viruses and it overreacts. It basically causes too much reaction and which starts damage your own body. And that's where the cytokine storm comes. 
So in order to uh, stabilize this, immunity should be balanced both, um, as I said, acquired as well as innate immunity. Uh, so, um, and again, vitamin D, I think the important thing about vitamin D, it balances this act and it helps. Um, to reduce this pro-inflammatory cytokines and increase anti-inflammatory cytokines. So um, it's a Th1, Th17, and Th2 cells uh, or cytokines uh, mostly uh, um, have um, functions uh, during this process. And, and we, we, there's a lot out there about calcium and vitamin D and how they work together, but you mentioned another one that uh, typically... Um, doesn't seem to get as much uh, showcase or airtime as uh, calcium, and that's magnesium. And uh, yes, this is the Vitamin D and Me podcast, but what is magnesium's role in all of this, uh, as well as zinc for that matter, and how do they work with vitamin D to help with wellness and immune function? Yeah, it's uh, so in order for vitamin D to function well, there are certain nutrients which should be uh, uh, enough in our body. Or um, so one of them is magnesium. So if there is a magnesium deficiency, it's very hard to both calcium and vitamin D function and do they what they're supposed to do. Uh, which also we should remember that uh, vitamin K is one of the also major players. Um, in terms of zinc, it's one of our trace elements, and usually population which um, has high protein content of food, like meat, uh, milk, dairy products, high protein uh, contents, especially animal-based protein, there is not much zinc deficiency happening. Unless you are really do not take um, animal proteins much, then there are, might be some issues. And what are some of the kind of common food sources for things like uh, magnesium and you mentioned some around zinc uh, calcium's you know usually typically tied to dairy products but from uh, uh, where does one get magnesium food wise or vitamin k food wise so there are two different kinds of vitamin k right k1 and k2 uh, for k1 it's uh, mostly green leafy vegetables cow broccoli um, and others uh, which are important sources uh, for magnesium. Um, there are, uh, as I said, or zinc, um, uh, calcium too, I think milk, dairy products, um, uh, meat-based diet. Uh, it's pretty, all of them are the good sources um, of those micronutrients. Um, I know um, I have a little different approach in terms of calcium. I think both the United States as well as um, some other um, countries, especially United States, they uh, recommended dietary intake for the calcium is already quite high. It's 1,200 milligram per day uh, compared to some Asian country, for instance, to um, or even that even European country, UK, for instance, um, Japan, it's only 800 uh, milligram per day. It's uh, twice almost lower than the United States. Um, in order to, um, so, and also there is a, used to be, I mean, huge, I think, uh, um, um, I think campaign to consume as much as milk and dairy products as possible in order to get enough calcium and have a healthy bone. Uh, but the milk and dairy products is not the only source. It also contains um, many other bioactive substances uh, which might have some implications, um, including uh, active hormonal uh, like estrogen, progesterone, growth hormones, IGFs, um, mm. the cow's milk, as any uh, milk of um, you know mammal animals, it has uh, substances such as uh, such as just named. And I think we should also think about that. So again, the green leafy vegetables and some other organic sources, um, nuts, proteins, uh, uh, I think are very good sources. Um, and if you must. I think, um, you know, other organic sources of calcium, uh, again, would be better than just supplements, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks, Professor Gamma. That, that's really interesting information. Uh, uh, now, with that, though, obviously, there are certain, uh, so th there's many things that impact diet. 
you know, culture, cultural norms, socioeconomic factors, uh, seasonal availability, all sorts of things impact that. So out of interest, you've kind of got a really unique vantage point where you have a North American perspective and experience and uh, and and the Mongolian um, experience as well, which is a country that typically doesn't get a whole lot of uh, airtime in North America per se, uh, compared to say like a, a China or a Japan. But what are some of the... Um, diet differences in uh, between the U.S. and Mongolia and how they related back to um, COVID and wellness and immune function in general? Are there some key ones that uh, where one can one culture or one group can learn from the other a little bit more? Um, thank you. This is a really uh, nice question. Um, so for Mongolia, I think it's quite... Um, uh, it's, uh, as I said, the half of population of war nomads are still nomads. So there is a um, high consumption of meat, milk, data product. Um, mm. uh, it's one of the highest, I think, consumption worldwide in terms of the red meat uh, in high fat kind of products. Very low um, in consumption of uh, poultry, fish, um, you know, um, and uh, nuts uh, and so on. Um, green leafy vegetables, fresh uh, um, um, salads and so on are also very rarely consumed there. Um, so um, for it, 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 it would be really good to have much uh, larger variety of food in Mongolia. Um, but the problem is, as you said, uh, is the weather, there's the arable land. Um, there are many other issues, um, issues uh, when it comes to, you know, having uh, fresh vegetables all the time or having um, seafood. Um, so um, in the United States, on the other, uh, on the other hand, there is a, if you choose wisely, there is uh, so many um, food and diet you can um uh, select and eat. Um, so, um, you know, healthy vegetables, healthy fruits, uh, nuts, uh, fish, uh, poultry, you know, um, in the healthy fat diet, all these available. Um, I think um, uh, for the several years, there have been too much um, a focus on uh, fat. Um, uh, we were saying that fat is bad for you. Um, you know, it translates to high cholesterol, high heart stroke, uh, heart disease, and so on. But we didn't tell uh, well enough that what we should then replace, uh, what should be eaten instead of it. So many people replaced it with uh, carbohydrates, with the, um, simple carbohydrates specifically. And that's brought us to this high endemic of diabetes and other issues, high metabolic diseases and stuff like that. But in, um, so it's always good, I think, to have a well-balanced diet as well as um, good physical activity, especially outside during sun, spring, sunny um, or summer weather. Um, so if you, I mean, it's not very, um, I think, uh, smart or rocket science. <laughs> if you eat too much, you get fat. If you stop eating too much, too wrong food, you and then you start exercising, you will fit uh, and your immunity will be better. And then you have ability to fight against all the viruses, bacteria, and so on. So I think moderation is another thing we should really think about it, along with the diet and exercise. And um, drink, obviously, right? Um, having enough water, which is very um, seldom uh, experienced in other developing countries. For instance, in Mongolia, um, I don't, uh, not much water drinking or healthy drinking habits there. <laughs> it's quite a um, dry area there. Mm. Um, good thing is that I think Mongolia has a very good uh, high, um, you know, uh, animal-based diet. And as long as there is a, a certain moderation uh, and adding uh, more green leafy fresh vegetables, um, that should be um, good. 
Excellent. And then just as we wrap up here today, uh, Professor Gamma, just one more question around uh, for you and looking forward. You talked about the current study you're recruiting for, and obviously that's uh, a very exciting initiative. But um, going forward for vitamin D as it relates to COVID or immune function or anything else, what are what's you know what makes you hopeful? What is an exciting development that you see on the horizon in this field of science? Um, there are all these good or bad thing. I think uh, <laughs> there are much more uh, things into the uh, the immunity, infectious disease, or health disparity. All these things or believe, you know, um, real science, um, all the things come into the light, I think, thanks to COVID, if I can say thanks. Um, uh, so in many countries, I think we have forgotten about real science. Um, there were, um, ma majority of focus was on, I don't know, on, on many different things besides science. Science was never a priority in many countries. Um, but now I think uh, it's getting to the uh, focus. See how for other countries, countries who really care about the population, about the, the uh, you know, um, about equality, equity, uh, putting funds to the science or medical area, they do quite well um, during this endemic and pandemic. Doesn't matter how much money you have, how much funds you have. I think it, what is the priority, where you're putting your money is very, I think, important. And um, the uh, real science, um, and then believing our own scientists, doctors, nurses, all these people who are fighting on front line every day and appreciating their work, remembering this, mm -hmm. uh, that's all the good thing actually come out from this pandemic after all. So yeah. we're hoping really that, you know, uh, that will continue and we will be much better prepared for the next pandemic, which will happen. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Professor Gamma, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate uh, all of your insights and thank you for your work and all the research you're doing in this area. Thank you kindly. Thank you, William, so much. Mm -hmm.